It's good to see everyone. And thanks so much for tuning in. Um, here we are the, nearing the end of yet another semester. And uh, it's great to have blue skies outside. And, uh, and this is a time, of course, as we head into commencement, a time that we celebrate. And thank you to everyone on the campus, uh, faculty and staff members who have supported our students in so many great ways to get them to this point where uh, we hit the the, the piece de resistance, right? Commencement, which is uh, ultimately what we're about, preparing our, our students to go out and, and serve society. Um, and let me encourage you also to, to do something this commencement season that you, may, you might not have done previously. If there's a ceremony that you have always been saying, I should really go to that one, resolve this year to, to make it the time where you do that. So let me encourage you to get involved with all the celebrations of our students. Um, in addition, I I have giant, I mean, these are really big awards, literally. Um, these are the awards that the university has received recently. Um, the one to my left uh, is um, the Larry, Nab Larry Abernathy Award, which is awarded by the International Town Gown Association. And uh, this was an award that we had won um, for much the great transformation that's happened on our campus. And similarly, um, the, uh, this is the ACE Fidelity Investments Transformation Award, which recognized um, similar activities, but also the growing partnerships that we see between the university, the city of Grand Forks, um, and uh, initiatives like the work that we're doing with the U.S. Space Force, and, and, and just really the transformation that's happened on our campus. And of course, um, just as we get honored for the work that's, that's gone on, there's, there's much more work to, to, to go as well. Uh, we recognize that these are snapshots at a point in time, and uh, we want to make sure that we continue the hard work to make sure we satisfy our campus members and uh, do the things that will move the university forward. Um, I wanted to also uh, just let you know the ballrooms have been uh, alive over the last week at the Memorial Union uh, with recognition activities, um, uh, the Aviation Awards. So this just dates back to, to Sunday night. Aviation Awards, and then the National Residence Hall Honors uh, Group on Sunday, and then uh, Student Diversity and, and Inclusion had a graduation acknowledgement ceremony and award ceremony on Monday. And then we had the Lavender graduation ceremony uh, last night, which uh, honors and celebrates the achievements of our LGBTQ plus uh, students and graduates. And it continues tonight with student government awards and on Friday with student leadership awards. Again, this is just an amazing time for celebration on the campus. Um, I, I mentioned uh, student diversity and inclusion as, as award recipients this week. I also wanted to, to highlight the fact that um, uh, this semester I authorized two additional uh, positions within student diversity and inclusion. Uh, the first is uh, a full-time director of the Pride Center, and the second is a full-time director of the American Indian Center. And so um, uh, Dr. Tomaquee Bailey, of course, and uh, Stacey Borboa peterson are working hard to, uh, to, to begin to advertise those positions and to, to fill those critical needs. And uh, in addition, as we head into the summer, let's all reflect upon the successes that we've had, the challenges that we've faced, um, acknowledge uh, any failures that we've had uh, during the year and look forward to, to uh, transforming the campus, overcoming those challenges and making sure that we create opportunities to get better. Um, this, this is also, this getting better is also the essence of our strategic planning process. And uh, thanks again to Lynette Kornelka and Jim Machork, who will say a few words here in a moment, but uh, their work across the campus has been extraordinary and, uh, and really pulling together the voices from all, all corners of the campus. And, uh, and I appreciate all the contributions that campus members have made towards those efforts. And furthermore, I, I have to applaud all of you for the, the efforts that you've made across the campus to support one another, to love one another, and to, to give it your all. Every single person on this campus has a role in achieving our important mission. And I appreciate everything that everybody does to make that happen. And I certainly look forward to the questions that you have for the whole team who's here today, our, our vice presidents, our associate vice presidents, our directors, uh, our athletic director. I mean, there's just a lot of people on the screen today that will answer your questions. And let me, before we get to the questions and answers, let me turn it over to um, uh, Jim and Lynette for uh, their comments and an update about the strategic plan. So over to you. Well, hi folks. Uh, we've been giving a fairly regular set of updates. Uh, the, the last time we gave them was April the 4th. Since that time, we, uh, that was when we rolled out uh, the, the seven major themes that are going to inform the work of the work groups that are now busily studying those themes as potential strategic pillars for the, for the new UND plan. Um, we reached out to, uh, after a lot of consultation between the the strategic planning committee and the executive uh, 
council and other bodies, we came up with a, an incredible list of potential leaders for these work groups who are going to be doing much of the work, uh, the, the core research work for the, for the actual strategic planning process. And we have an almost perfect record of getting all of our first choices. We've got an incredibly talented team. Anyone who's interested can go to the strategic planning website where we have all the information on membership, both of the SBC and the individual work groups, uh, plus minutes of meetings. We want this to be as transparent a uh, process as possible. Uh, we are now in the process, the, the strategic planning committee itself, now that we have the work groups up and running with liaisons from, uh, from the SBC itself uh, on each group. But the SBC, the, the strategic planning committee itself, is now looking at questions of mission, values, vision, uh, which we're going to harness with all the reports that are going to be coming into us uh, later on in the later in the summer from the work groups. Um, and I must say that the only problem that we have had, and of course we have to work very hard and very fast, but we had such a great response to our call for work group members when we sent out uh, a call March 30th and left it open until April the 6th. We actually had far more people than we could possibly use on each one of the work groups, but we are actively working to have all those people who self-nominated and have been nominated in any other way, shape, or form to be contacted, and we're going to utilize those folks in terms of focus groups, advisory councils, things like this. We are trying to make sure that everyone who wants to have a voice in this process will be heard. Um, and to that end, both the work groups, but especially the SPC, because we've been planning this for a little while now, we've actually launched a series of focus groups to get feedback on mission, vision, and values of the SBC's primary work right now. And we're actually, many of you folks probably would have been asked to help us uh, contact some work groups. Many of you listening to us have actually been asked to take part. Um, and we're starting this process. Right now, we're focusing upon students and faculty because, of course, we realize that the school year is ending. And so we want to get a hold of as many of the voices from this group, these groups, as is possible. Uh, that's what we're doing right now. We have, a, I think, a great list of natural focal points for, for, our, uh, for our focus groups, both among students and faculty. Uh, but we're also trying to reach out beyond the usual suspects. And so, for example, uh, Karen Plum, uh, Plum is out there, and she came up with a list of randomized students for us that we can reach out to. So we're not just hitting everyone from student government or the other groups that Although we will be consulting them, we want to hear the voice of everyone in any way that we can. Um, and so really, that is pretty much where we are. We're starting to host all of these events for faculty and students, these focus groups. And this is where we are. Lynette. Thanks. So when you're having focus groups, you need sets of questions. So what we have done now, the um, strategic planning committee has developed two sets of questions and these will be posted on the strategic planning website. So we've developed a, a set for faculty and we have already utilized those um, with the uh, department chairs yesterday. So that was great to get that feedback and wonderful feedback is coming in. And then we also developed a set of questions for students. And these are real, both of the sets of questions right now are really going to support the work of our SPC that Jim and I are leading, um, again, as he said, looking at the mission, vision, and, and core values. So we have, uh, there's probably about 12 focus groups already scheduled, and there will, will be more scheduled to gather this initial information um, that will help us with our mission, values, and vision. Um, and then we've also, we're also scheduling focus groups for later in May, once students and faculty might be leaving campus, and then we'll start focusing more on staff, um, alumni, and uh, UND, or the broader community, uh, Grand Forks and, and beyond. So that's kind of where we're at with the focus groups. Um, we, um, as I said, the summer months are gonna be very, very busy. We'll be looking at drafting our mission, vision, values once we do get um, some of the additional feedback from those focus groups. And at the same time, our work groups are undertaking 
their their work on their broad themes, as Jim said. So there, we're we're really going to be have to be harmonizing this information as the work groups are working, the SP, SPC is working, and all of this has to be um, have, have to has to come together. Also supporting what's happening with um, with our capital campaign, making sure that we're harmonizing the ideas that are being discussed with our capital campaign. Um, with UND branding. So a lot of different pieces are coming together. And um, it's, it's, again, been a very, very exciting process. So August, um, we're going to have a retreat with the um, Executive Council. And at that retreat, we're going to share some preliminary work that the work groups have been doing. So a little bit of um, preliminary work on their uh, maybe strategic pillars, on their action items, their metrics. But again, it won't be a complete document. But we'll get we'll be able to have a chance at the retreat to have the captains of the work groups and um, and our S, our full SPC to really gather some feedback from that executive council. That will be important for us. And then on um, September, we'll see. We'll see some additional writing uh, happening between the SPC gathering um, additional information, maybe through additional focus groups. We really feel like we might come away with um, less pillars than what, than what we have now as far as work groups. As the work groups are working, they're conversing between amongst themselves. And so we might see five or six pillars, strategic pillars come out of that work. We're just not sure yet. Late September, we're going to circulate the draft plan or the draft pillars um, and our work on the mission values and vision, getting feedback. Um, October, we're probably going to have another town hall to really bring out that draft plan, get some additional feedback from all of you. And then November and December, we'll be writing and really trying to finalize a wonderful open um, inclusive strategic plan that we can then present to the president in December, which will be launched then in January. So that's kind of where we've been, where we're headed. And again, it's been an exciting process. Well, Lynette and Jim, thanks so much for that overview. And we appreciate all the touch points that you're creating across uh, the campus. And uh, I know that there'll be a number of questions that pop up. In fact, I think there's several already. Uh, let me remind all of our attendees that the way to ask a question is actually through the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen. And uh, our Vice President for Finance and Operations, Jed Shivers, is going to moderate the questions. And he always does a great job. So Jed, let me turn it over to you to, to begin the, uh, the Q&A portion. Well, hi, everybody. And uh, just delightful to be able to talk with all of you. Uh, here today, as uh, the president pointed out, the sun is shining. Uh, Hopefully the pandemic is steadily receding into the endemic and uh, looking forward to uh, the end of the semester and a lovely summer. So I personally feel like, you know, things are starting to bloom and I hope you all are as well. Um, so <clears throat> we do have a couple of questions and I really do ask you uh, to, um, you know, to submit questions. Uh, uh, it's very important that we hear from everybody. That's what these uh, open houses uh, or town hall meetings are for. And uh, so I'm hoping that you all will participate to the extent that you're comfortable in doing so and give us something, give us something to talk about. So we do have a question that's come up and that is the question is about uh, salary rate and raises. Can you explain how salary raises will be decided this year across the board raises for all percentage based merit market raises, et cetera? So, you know, uh, basically, uh, salary and wage increases are legislatively defined for the most part. Um, and we're working with a 2% merit pool. And we really do believe in merit. Now, obviously, when you have 2% to work with, you don't have a lot of play in one direction or another. But there are still gradations that you can apply, and Peggy can talk about that. Peggy Varberg, our Associate Vice President for Human Resources. But the point is, is that it is a merit-based system. 2% is the pool. All the units got their uh, you know, assignments of dollars, and you basically work with those dollars to provide it to anybody who is eligible. Not all people are eligible for merit uh, increases. So 
that is really the primary uh, you know, mechanism that we have. Be interesting to see uh, in the FY, um, in, the, in the following fiscal year, FY24, what the legislature does relative to inflation that we're experiencing. So stay tuned on that. There's a lot of conversation about that, about the potential effects of inflation on the university system and at UND in particular. So, uh, you know, we'll see what, what comes of that uh, TBD. But uh, for now, for the FY23, it's a 2% merit pool. It's true merit. And uh, so let me ask Associate Vice President uh, Peggy Barbary, anything you want to add? No, I think you did a great job. Um, it's, it is merit, so it's based on evaluations and discussions about what's gone on with each of our employees in the last year. Um, local supervisors and leaders in each area uh, make those decisions. And um, as you know, Jed mentioned, they all get a 2% uh, pool based on their salaries in, the, in each area, each unit. And, that, and then they apply it across that way. Um, we do you know, have to look at those that aren't meeting minimums who have development opportunities so that we can um, work with them. And, and those people who, who do receive a less, um, does not meet, um, aren't eligible for the merit. Uh, I can say by and large, there's very, very few each year, um, less than five generally um, for the staff, is, you know, and staff is six, 17, 1800 people. So that's pretty good. We have a lot of people who do really great work. Um, and then we just have a few people that we need to help um, get there. And, and that's our plan to do. So. Thank you, Peggy. I just want to flip back to our, uh, to uh, Lynette and Jim for just a second. Uh, got a question. Will the strategic open house be recorded? I teach at that time, asks a faculty member. Oh. Um. Well, unfortunately, no, because we're, we're having eight different breakout rooms, and so it'd be very hard to have a, a unified broadcast, but we are going to have notes being taken in each one of the sessions, each one of the breakout rooms, so someone who could not be there will at least be able to follow what transpired in each one of the breakout rooms, because uh, otherwise we'd have to have eight separate uh, recordings. And then we'll put those notes up on the website, on the strategic planning website. Great. So you're going to effectively take minutes of the meetings, which is really yep. good. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Yep. Thanks for that. Uh, quick question for Associate Vice President Mike Pieper. Back in 2018, there are proposals to renovate Babcock Hall. Was funding uh, to support that secured? Is the building currently in use? Just curious, as I pass by the building every day on my way to and from the new South parking lot. And Mike, I, 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 this is for you and all your folks, which is fabulous, by the way, that part was in parentheses. So um, uh, Mike, do you wanna talk a little bit about Babcock? I would say, I, I would say answer to the first question is no, uh, there is no funding to secure to support it. I think that's a future plan. Would we like to do it? Absolutely, it's a beautiful building. But Mike, if you wanna talk a little bit about it. Yeah, the, the only formal thing that we have from a funding standpoint is, um, Fundraising was approved for that building, but there's no active fundraising campaign happening at the time. We were holding the building for potential um, use for College of Engineering and Mines. Um, their planning is starting to kind of wind down and get a sense for what their future needs are. I would say their plan lends leans towards um, that they do not need that building. So we'll still hold the building and, and look for a future use. Facilities did put a new roof on it to um, stop the water infiltration and to preserve the building from any future damage. Um, and so it is, um, it is in, a, in a kind of a safe holding pattern right now. Thank you, Mike. Okay, next question. We're starting to get some questions. Please keep those questions coming. Uh, can you explain why the amount of our salary raises are dictated by the state legislature when only a portion of our overall budget comes from state appropriations? Really great question. So the basic answer is that uh, the legislature, uh, if you look at it on an ongoing operating basis, the state general fund funds about 22% of the uh, overall operating budget. And are we glad to have it? I mean, without it, uh, we would not exist basically. Uh, but the legislature does include uh, merit pool in that. 
And uh, by and large, uh, we, we follow uh, legislative guidelines. Uh, that's why uh, we'll see what happens in the FY24 as we get into the new biennial process. So generally speaking, we, we hew pretty closely to the legislature. And remember, in past years, sometimes the legislature does uh, go a bit deeper. If you recall, in prior biennia, in the first year of the biennium, they uh, have said not only will there be a merit pool, but there also be mandatory minimum amounts for people who make uh, at dollar X or below to ensure that those uh, people, you know, get a certain, at least a certain minimum amount of money. So we really do uh, follow, uh, you know, what they are, uh, what they are deciding. Uh, but there is a, it's a give and take kind of a relationship. Um, next question. Oh, and uh, quite a germane, nice segue. Uh, how is the university preparing for the new legislative session and do we have priorities in mind? This is a question for uh, me as well as the president and uh, Vice President Wynn. If units have items of interest for the session, how do we advance them? So um, uh, let me turn that over to the president and then I can, I can speak a little bit on the parts that I'm involved with, but I think uh, President Armacos, if you could speak to that first, please. So broadly across the North Dakota University system, the chancellor has uh, put together a working group that's looking at a variety of areas for, um, for legislative support. Um, and we are providing input uh, through uh, faculty and administration uh, to, to those items. Um, and uh, inflation is probably at the top of the list on most people's minds. How do we respond? And Jed can talk about the work that he's involved with. We did brief the governor in March uh, with what we felt were um, uh, good policy priorities that would then feed the legislative session. And it included things like uh, merit pool adjustments um, uh, to enhance employee retention, adjusting the funding formula to account for inflationary impacts, um, adjust um, essentially a maintenance budget. It's called the tiers funding, but a maintenance budget for capital improvements to account for inflation as well as costs go up. And so those three items were about inflation. The others were um, either continuation of initiatives that we had started previously or um, new initiatives. Uh, one is using the legacy fund of the state uh, and the earnings on that legacy fund to support research and development for the purpose of economic diversification. Um, we, we put in a plug for uh, increasing campus mental health resources, particularly for students, but also for faculty and staff, um, supporting high-speed computing networks, uh, developing Native American college readiness programs across the entire state for the whole system, and then looking at how we can um, support uh, key workforce development areas for the state. Uh, in particular, is there initial work we can do on, des uh, on designing um, potentially an allied health building that would combine biomedical research and, and nursing, um, as well as a, a STEM and engineering slash national security uh, a building or quarter on campus. And so, so these are some of the ideas we put forward to the governor and um, uh, we'll, the conversations will continue. If you have, if you have suggestions or wishes, uh, certainly feed them up um, through, uh, through, through your deans or through your vice presidents and uh, we'll certainly uh, consider them at the executive council. Jed, over to you. Well, uh, Josh, Dr. Wynn, did you wanna comment also? Yes, thank you, Jed. I just wanted to double down on the president's suggestion that if you have good ideas, please feed them forward to us. Uh, this is the perfect time for it. Uh, I know at the School of Medicine and Health Sciences, we try to, through the budget process, think of areas where we're going to look for, forward to for growth. But if you have a, a great new idea, please go through the uh, chain of command and get that up to us because we are eager to hear from you as far as suggestions for the future. Thank you. Thank you. So I, I, without taking too much more time, I think uh, you know, there's, an, there's an economics group uh, you know, uh, that's head, headed by uh, Tim Mahalik, who is the uh, chairman of the Budget and Finance Committee of the State Board of Higher Education. And I'm on that along with my counterpart from North Dakota State, some additional other presidents are on that. And basically, uh, we're really looking at uh, the kinds of inputs related to inflation that you would expect. So wage and salary increase and upward pressure, which not only comes from 
whatever the merit pool turns out to be, but also pressure on you know reevaluations that are market based. Um, also, uh, goods and services. So I think anyone who goes shopping today knows that their goods and services expenses are rising. And then finally, construction. And so I'm working, and I I'm, I I may misname them, but our very own economists here at UND. And if I'm, I'm hoping I get the name right, an Institute of Policy Analysis. Uh, I'm working with them directly to try and get uh, at least Midwestern specific indices of the areas that I've talked about. Um, and we're, we have a good collaborative effort going and I really appreciate their efforts. And we're gonna take those data and provide them uh, to the upcoming meeting with the chancellor and all the presidents. So there's real active participation in terms of our economics faculty in this question, which I really appreciate. And each one of those areas, so the, the wage and salary stuff would be affected by the merit pool, but then who funds it? So we would hope we would get greater coverage of merit pool funding. We'll see how that goes. We'll see what the merit pool turns out to be. Next would be perhaps an adjustment to the formula for goods and services expenses. That's sort of an operating you know, kind of a thing. And then lastly would be increases to the tiers of capital funding that we have, recognizing their substantial increases in construction costs. So that's sort of how we're approaching it now. These are recommendations that we provide. They ultimately go to the State Board of Higher Education, which then in turn interacts with the governor and the legislature. And so our, our, our goal here is to provide as good information as we can provide. So that, that's where we really are at this point. Uh, ah, uh, given the next question, given the high rate of inflation, is there any consideration from NDUS to request the interim budget committee legislature for salary supplements? So as far as I am aware, there is, it is unlikely that we will see action. Now, that may not necessarily be accurate. Uh, that's obviously up to the legislature, but I think I can honestly say I am unaware of any interim action that will take place at this time. Uh, therefore, I think the likelihood is, is that when, when we get relief, it'll probably be in the FY24 time period. But we'll see, right? I mean, it depends upon uh, the legislature and how what they perceive. I think one nice aspect that we have in our state is that it's doing well economically in terms of its budget versus actuals. And it's doing well because of federal dollars availability. So, uh, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that all plays out. A uh, question for uh, Mike Pieper and actually for me. Is there talk of moving central finance team out of Twomley? If so, what would the timeline look like? So, uh, you know, this is really a matter of uh, the question of to what extent Twomley is taken up in the Merrifield Twomley renovations that are taking place in order to create a really wonderful uh, teaching and academic venue uh, between Twomley and Merrifield, which we view as a two building system. Um, and at this point in time, uh, I don't know whether or not uh, central finance actually includes me. <laughs> And uh, we're waiting to see what those plans will look like, whether or not we'll need to uh, move. And of course, if we know if we have to move, then we're gonna get a pretty good sense of when we would have to move. So Mike, do you have any comments along those lines further? Um, no, I think you, you hit on all the main points. The only thing I would add is I, I, I would expect that the space programming of Merrifield and Tuomly to kind of wind down in May. So. Um, by the end of May, we'll have a good sense of what space is needed in Tuomly to make the Merrifield Tuomly um, project work from an academic standpoint. And then we can look at how to backfill the, the remaining space. Thanks, Mike. Um, so I think, let me just make sure I'm kind of where I need to be. Ah, yes. Quick uh, academic question for Provost Eric Link. Question is, how are things going with the HLC reaffirmation process? Uh, thanks, Jed, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is a timely question because just yesterday I had an exchange with Tim Burroughs on this very question. So uh, I can give you hot off the press information about where we stand. Uh, and I actually have his email in front of me. So uh, Tim reports, uh, it's a very positive report. Things are, are going very well. 
Uh, the multi-site report has been submitted to HLC uh, just this week, maybe Monday, uh, by the uh, by Ken Ruitt over in the uh, School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Uh, that has to do with our Bismarck and Minot medical sites. Uh, the quality initiative report is in draft stage is on, and is on target to be completed in another uh, four to six weeks. And then the assurance argument itself is moving ahead of schedule with all of the individual working teams uh, who are involved in the drafting of the assurance argument uh, making great progress. Uh, the executive committee for the HLC uh, assurance argument writing process has been reviewing early drafts. So everything is all systems go uh, and that's uh, fantastic. So I wanna thank Tim uh, and for his leadership and all the others on the executive committee uh, steering this, this initiative forward. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Wynn, I see your hand up. Are, are... And I don't know if I missed you a while ago or what, so please go ahead. Well, I just wanted to update people that the accreditation process for the medical program at UND, that is the medical doctor program was completed earlier this morning. The team met with President Armacost and me, and we expect to hear more over the subsequent weeks and months. The official determination of the accreditation status will not be until late October, but the visit seemed to go well, uh, but time will tell. Yeah, thank you and great to hear from uh, both uh, the, uh, from Provost Lincoln and Vice President Wynn. Uh, so we, you know, we can't really have these meetings unless we talk a little bit about parking, right? So a um, couple of questions, which I'm gonna send to Mike on parking. Uh, parking, we'll, on parking, we'll, so first of all, I guess we have a parking committee. Have we actually gotten all the members, uh, that we need for the parking committee? Or are we still waiting on anyone, Mike, uh, to, to join? Um, I have, uh, to my knowledge, we, we do not have all the members appointed yet. Um, but that, that was as of maybe two weeks ago. Okay. So let's check to see whether or not, um, you know, the folks that said that they would be nominating members have done so. If we could, it would be nice to get at least one meeting this semester. Um, so anyway, so understandably, uh, two questions. Uh, will there be, will parking permits for 22-23, so FY23, stay the same or are there discussions for rate increases? Will there be changes in parking and parking permit rates next year? So this is a question that at least a couple of people I have an interest in asking. You throwing that one to me? <laughs> I am, Mike. Um, yeah, I mean, the conversation has been um, kind of getting the parking committee reconstituted. Um, you know, if we can get a meeting in this year, we're not going to have a lot of time to have deep conversations. So we're kind of gearing up for a full agenda, full year of parking conversations. Next year, um, I personally raised the question of, you know, in lieu, in lieu of a no parking committee, you know, do we look at a cost of living type increase, small incremental increase? Um, and, you know, there were some questions raised by employees campus wide of potentially opening up um, reserve parking for all employees. Um, that may or may not happen. Um, waiting for that committee to start. But uh, um, our parking season starts August 1st and we start to get communications from parents and things um, happening shortly after the end of the year. So it's looking more like probably parking as usual going into next year with a full year of parking committee work. Thanks, Mike. Maybe uh, we, you know, I think what you're saying is not so certain we'll get our committee together in time. Uh, we'll see whether or not we can. And if not, you know, maybe the executive council may want to weigh in on, you know, whether or not we want to do anything for this coming year or not or hold. So TBD, I would say. Um, quick question for Associate Vice President uh, Peggy Barber. Will the 2022 staff recognition ceremony be streamed online for those who are not comfortable 
with being in person, person for health reasons. Yes, it's our intent to look into streaming at least part of um, part of the, the you know the, cere- the award ceremony portion um, to campus or out so people have a connection and can watch that. Thank you. And another question for you, Peggy. Uh, since COVID has decreased, are things getting back to normal and things are getting back to normal here on campus? Why are there still people working remotely? I know President Armacost has mentioned in past meetings that he wants everyone on campus again. So why is there still remote work for some? Um, Well, we do have a task force that's being put together that's gonna look at that for our UND culture um, and Vice President Shivers will be leading that task force. Um, But part of of the reason why we still still have some remote going on or hybrid going on um, has a little bit to do with retention and recruitment. Um, so we find that we're able to do um, some recruitments for positions uh, that may be more specialized, that, that we don't find local um, or even regional um, candidates for, and, and some of those folks may not necessarily want to move to North Dakota. Um, so we, that's an option that we have. Um, obviously, there are some folks that, um, uh, you know, the positions have shown to be uh, more um, efficient because they're they're not working on campus. That sounds crazy, I know, but um, because they don't maybe have the interruptions, um, they're able to, um, you know, really point towards um, their data work and so forth. Um, they don't have a forward-facing customer necessarily that um, is required uh, to, to, to be present. You know, they're required to be present all the time. Um, but also this is, this is a shift in higher ed in general um, that we're seeing. If you look at any of the major Chronicle of Higher Ed, um, any of those um, uh, documents, they're, they're showing this is a shift in higher ed, um, having more remote or hybrid, whether it's 100% or hybrid, some on, some off, um, opportunities um, for, for staff and faculty to, to do their work here. So. President Armacost, uh, did you want to comment? Right, since there was a comment attributed to me, uh, let me clarify what, what I said previously. I, as we are debating the continuation of remote or hybrid work, um, I, I have made comments about my belief that we're in a very human-focused uh, business or enterprise uh, endeavor uh, here at UND. Um, and that human connection is important. Um, I had urged people uh, to not fear coming back to campus and encouraged them to come back to campus. What I didn't do is issue a mandate for everyone to come back. There were other schools within the system that said everybody will report back to work. And I fell short of that. And it was in recognition of some of those points that Peggy had made. And so uh, I appreciate Jed leading the task force on what's the future of remote and hybrid work. And um, and we have to make some smart decisions uh, for our campus. Um, there, are, there are places where remote or hybrid work certainly makes sense. Um, uh, in addition, again, we also have to uh, maintain this, uh, the notion that uh, we're in a very human uh, focused um, endeavor. Thanks. Thank you. I mean, again, I, 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 all I would add is uh, there are certain areas of the university where people work remotely and without the ability to work remotely, we wouldn't have the capabilities that we have. So. There's a, there's a degree of pragmatism that kind of is at play in some of these decisions and they really are adjudicated on the basis of whether or not, you know, management perceives that the uh, job is appropriately done remotely or in a hybrid fashion or must be done in person. So and Jed, more to come on this. It's a, this is not a piece of cake. And Jed, there's a growing body of literature too that um, addresses what works and what doesn't. It debunks myths about our belief in hybrid work or remote work. And so we'll pay close attention to those. uh, Yeah. yeah. So we, we, like the rest of the world, I think are all kind of grasping with this interesting issue. Uh, So quick, another quick parking question for Mike Pieper. Is the parking lot going away by Wilkerson when the buildings are done or are we getting more parking there? Um. The, the Wilkerson parking lot will remain, um, they need to preserve um, truck delivery access to Wilkerson. Um, there may be a, some slight alterations to the lot to make it truck delivery work with the new building, um, but it will, it will remain in place. It won't be enlarged. Thank you. Uh, interesting question for Peggy. Does the university follow the career classification pay scale salary ranges that the state follows? And if not, why? 
I recently came across information on the North Dakota Office of Management and Budget website regarding state pay, and it doesn't seem to align with the university salary in certain areas. An interesting question. Peggy, good question. What, are your, what are your thoughts? Yeah, it's a good question. The answer is no. Um, we don't align with what the state does. We align with what the North Dakota University system requires, which is our broadbanding system. And so each position is put into a specific band and then a job code based on the duties and responsibilities. And then we go through the market um, analysis with that and then they're assigned a market. Um, we have some positions that are similar and so across campus, there are many positions that have the same market or the same, you know, that are in the same job code. Um, but job codes are unique and um, uh, job families um, are unique in the bands. Um, so in part of this, we are required when we have a brand new position. I know this was another question that someone asked um, in the chat. So when we have a brand new position, we go through the position description, we being our compensation analyst here. Um, she goes through and she assigns it a job band and a job family. And then she has to send it to two other schools, NDSU and Minot, for them to review and agree or have discussions about why they wouldn't agree. So um, any new positions, you know, they do go through a, quite a process to get developed. Um, and then with regard to how we look at market and what salary surveys, we have many salary surveys that we use. The largest and chief among them is um, COOPA, College University Personnel Association. It's pretty standard across most universities. Um, and then we have a, a few others. So we do look at national salaries, regional salaries, local salaries. We use the MSA um, for, for positions that we would really recruit locally on. Um, but we use the Fargo-Moorhead MSA because it's um, actually a higher value. And so we've chosen to use theirs in addition to it's a larger um, community. And so we have a better opportunity um, or chance to actually um, connect to a, a position that's that's very close to what we have. Um, so there's a lot of work that's done around there. It's quite a process. Um, and, um, you know, like I said, we use several, several different surveys, um, as do most of the um, 10 schools or 10 other schools in NDUS. They're very similar. Um, on faculty, we use the Oklahoma survey, and then we might um, use some, some information out of Coupa as well. Thanks, Peggy. Uh, this is an interesting question, and I I'm I know I don't know if this is a Lynette question or a President uh, Armacost question, but the question is how, and I guess the, uh, also are, but how are nine month employees, faculty and staff, being compensated for their time engaging in a strategic strategic plan planning work group? So I guess the first question is, are they? I presume this is if they're doing it over the summer. And then the second question is, how are they? Right, the nine month, um, nine or 10 month positions for summer work, the work group members will not receive compensation. The SPC and the captains of the work groups will receive compensation because of the deliverables that they are going to be delivering. Um, lots and lots of writing. President Amarcos, I don't know if you want to add anything to that, but that's what uh, we have decided answer. on. Thank you. Um, quick question for President Armacos. Can the president give an update on the salary task force he discussed previously? Sure, I, I had made brief mention of this in one of the bi-weekly videos. And, and since then we're working to, uh, and Peggy can give a, a, a quick update on the status, but um, a request for proposal uh, for companies to come in and assist us with this. There, there are companies that do these, this type of salary work professionally and they'll be a big assistance to us. Um, to, to lay out the general framework, um, what we will look at is faculty and staff. Um, and in particular, first with faculty and then with staff, um, are there, um, Disparities in pay uh, with respect to things like gender or race. Um, the, the second item is, are there disparities across the campus between uh, work units and divisions? And then third, is there disparity between what we offer on campus and what the market is, is telling us? And again, we'll do that first for faculty and then for staff. But this is why we're hiring a consultant to help us with this, because um, that kind of benchmarking is, is difficult, but there are tried and true methods that uh, these folks have used. Peggy? 
uh, support everything that you just said. Uh, timelines, we're working to finish that scope of work hopefully Friday um, as a draft and get that to um, the president and others to review um, and look at and then move forward with that. So. All right, here's, a, here's an interesting question. And I think there's a lot uh, implied in this question, but let me read it. And I, I think what I'll do is I'm gonna ask uh, President Armacost to comment on this briefly, and I can also. So the question is, uh, when looking at salary increase of faculty slash staff, why does you indeed not take into consideration the rise of inflation or cost of living increase? How does the university justify 1.5 million in specialty windows for the library alone? Um, and again, I, I can't speak to the specifically about spending that money on the library, but I know the library is, we've spent quite a bit of money on the library for renovation. So I think the first, to me, as I'm thinking about this question, the first part of the question is, you know, are we, are we, are we doing what we can for our faculty and staff, and are we, uh, or, and if we're not, are we doing it because we're spending money to improve the infrastructure of the campus? So, President Armacost, do you want to talk about that just for a minute, and I can also chime in? Sure. The, when we allocate money for um, physical campus projects versus personnel, um, it's not fungible money. Yeah, we can't just divert the 1.5 million that was allocated for one. Uh, purpose into another. Um, so that's the first challenge. Um, we, as I mentioned, the salary study will point to our market competitiveness and, and maybe that gives us some leverage to make some change. Um, but when it comes to merit increases, for example, um, we, we align uh, with what the state employees are granted by the legislature. And, and this, this year it was a 2.0% uh, increase. Jed? Yeah, I think, uh, again, my sense, and uh, we'll see whether or not this is borne out, is that, uh, you know, the, um, the legislature, if they do choose to act, recognizing the inflation that we're all feeling, uh, the fix will be likely, but not necessarily for certain, be a retrospective one. Uh, and uh, that is, you know, what we have to work with. So um, I think, um, you know, we're obviously generating data to move them in that direction. Um, and whether they accept it or not, you know, they'll draw their conclusions. We can only do our best in providing good information. I think the question of, you know, are we, this is always a difficult question, I think, to be honest with you, because the question is, you know, are we prioritizing one thing over another? We have a strategic master plan. Uh, we're executing that strategic master plan. The goal is to make a more functional campus that hopefully will stimulate enrollment. And I remind you that we're still in a place where we're seeing uh, mildly eroding credit hours. And so I think we need to do whatever we need to do in order to stimulate increased enrollment on the part of the university. That doesn't necessarily mean that we have to have our faculty and staff you know, uh, sacrifice. So uh, I think that's where the president speaks to, you know, the issues of, uh, you know, faculty competitiveness, competitiveness, salary studies, uh, equity studies, and the ongoing uh, market evaluations that take place all the time that are done by human resources. So uh, it's a great question. Uh, you know, I think it's an evolving situation. Um, Quick question for Peggy Varber. If a, a person is still remote when their position is intended to be in person, when will they no longer be able to use the pandemic as an excuse not to be here? So a bit pejorative question, but uh, Peggy, I think you know, management basically has an obligation to review the, uh, you know, the situation that reflects that specific individual's job description and management reserves the right to decide if they must come in, they must come in, right? That is correct. Um, that's that's it. I mean, it really um, depends on the position and the leadership and the goals of, uh, you know, the exterior facing what, whatever that position calls for. Um, I will add to that. And I'll ask Donna Smith, assistant vice president for um, equal opportunity in Title IX to um, to show herself here, too. We got a second question to that regarding um, uh, remote and um, an ADA accommodation. When does that go away? or could it go away based on um, COVID and so forth? So I'll let Donna maybe answer that one if she wants to. 
Sure. Thanks, Peggy. That those types of decisions are going to be made on a case by case basis through an interactive process involving the the employee, the employee supervisor, and then the HR manager who's facilitating that accommodation process. Um, you know, taking into consideration the individual employees needs, their impairments, their limitations, their work duties, and um, I really can't give a blanket answer for a question like that. Thank you. Uh, next question, uh, and I'm not sure I can see it. Do we know if Troy is in the meeting? I'm not seeing him, so. Okay, I, I assume he's not. All right, anyway, next question is, um, this may have been discussed in prior meetings, but what is the expected impact of Johnson Controls taking over housing and parking in terms of UND personnel and communication? So uh, I think Mike can speak to this. Uh, Dr. Beth Helwig, our interim vice president for student affairs may also speak to it. Uh, I think it's important to understand what Johnson Controls, really it's Johnson Controls, Corvius and Plenary, they're a group are doing. They're really taking over the operation and maintenance side and the capital uh, improvement side, but housing as a program continues to be run by housing people in the from the vice president for student affairs office. So, Mike, do you want to comment a little bit on you know what that split is, and maybe uh, Dr. Helwig, if you also would like to comment? Uh, sure. So the easy one is um, uh, um, Johnson. Plenary Corvus or JPC is not involved with parking. Um, from a UND housing standpoint, UND housing will be maintaining their internal custodial services. Um, like years past, that will stay in house. Um, like Jed had mentioned, it's mainly a focus on operations and maintenance and then future capital renewal. Um, the housing staff that used to work on operation and maintenance will be retained within facilities and work on non-housing buildings. Um, so there's no um, reduction in labor in terms of rifts or anything associated with this. Um, those people just shift towards non-housing buildings. Uh, thanks, Mike. I'll just go ahead and comment also. Uh, we have a great partnership, I think, with um, JCP. Uh, we've been working very collaboratively on the programmatic part of what the new residence halls are going to be looking at. And I'm very happy uh, the residence life staff will continue to be promoting excellent uh, programs, make students feel welcome. Uh, the RAs will still be there, the, the hall directors. So the programmatic elements of residence life will still be there. Uh, we continue to promote our special residential living learning communities and partnering with academic affairs. So I, I think you're gonna see a robust program with more uh, beautiful facilities and uh, a partnership with JCP. Thanks, Dr. Helwig and Mike. So uh, let me switch to a couple of questions for the provost area. First question, um, I have heard rumors of some possible program closures in education and humanities. Is there any truth to these rumors? Uh, I have not heard those rumors myself. Uh, I don't uh, know of any conversations uh, related to possible program closures in education or the humanities, which is not to say that there uh, have not been conversations that I'm unaware of in those colleges, but uh, nothing has reached uh, my ears. So I, I can't verify those rumors. Thank you. Uh, quick question for Madhavi. Uh, will UIT ever return to assisting with tech support tasks in person? For instance, if an employee receives a new computer, it seems the employees are required to set up their own computer, et cetera, all through a remote session. So not commenting on bad or good about that, uh, but your thoughts on, uh, on uh, direct uh, interaction with people. Yeah, thanks, Jed. Um, yes, we do provide on-site uh, support, especially for, with the new computers, we get them uh, to our UIT uh, workspace and we image them, prepare them, and then send it to the, uh, the owner. Uh, however, if you need additional uh, software installed, they, then we try to do that remotely. But if you do run into any issues, uh, you can always bring it uh, back to UIT and we will help you out. Um, so, uh, another question for the provost, I think, 
Um, and uh, the question is, is UND looking at right-sizing programs? Currently, UND has 30% of students of the University of Minnesota, but 85% of their programs. UND has similar student numbers to NDSU and University of Minnesota, but far more programs. Faculty and staff often address being overworked and underpaid without enough support. So I think the question is, are we too comprehensive and should we narrow our focus uh, commensurate with faculty size capabilities? You know, I'm just trying to interpret the question. So Provost Link, over to you. Yeah, this is a, a great and kind of complicated question. Uh, I will say that uh, the work of a comprehensive university such as UND is to constantly be engaged in self-study about the uh, array of programming that we offer to um, uh, the people that we serve. Uh, so we are always engaged in looking at um, uh, growth areas, areas where we can do consolidation if necessary, making sure that programs that are no longer active are putting, put on deactivated status. So this is a constant conversation that is going on uh, at the university and in each of the colleges. Uh, so I can't say, uh, I don't think anyone would ever want be able to say because this is an evolving um, culture of programming, uh, that is evolving to meet workforce needs, uh, career directions, uh, new developments in the academy, uh, we'll never be at a place where we say, aha, we've got it, this is exactly right. Uh, but what we want to do is be attentive to changes in uh, the interests and the needs of the region that we serve and make sure that we have the right array of programming that is adequately and properly resourced, uh, backed by uh, good staff support, uh, student interest, uh, faculty expertise, uh, necessary administrative and student success support uh, to make those programs that we do offer a success. So it's an ongoing conversation and it is in fact uh, the very work of our university. Thank you, Provost Link. Uh, so I think we're down to uh, two more minutes to go. Probably have one quick question left, and then I'm going to turn this over to President Armacost for closing remarks. Quick question Is there an update on the VP for research search? Yes. Um, so I've appointed a search chair in Provost Link. And in addition, we are in the process of, of forming the committee and developing the RFP um, that will go out for bid for search firms. And uh, the idea is that early in the summer to have a position announcement out and, uh, and to begin uh, collecting resumes. We don't have a deadline picked for um, submission of applications, but it'll, it'll probably be uh, in the September timeframe. So looking forward to getting that moving. This is a critical position for all of our campus, not just on the major funded research efforts, but uh, in support of, of all research activity across the campus. Thank you. Thank you. Anyway, I think we're pretty much out of time. We can't take any additional questions. Thank you so much. Uh, President Armacost, closing comments from you, please. Yeah, these are weeks of celebration. Uh, be sure to, uh, to relish in the work that you've done to get our students to where they are and let's celebrate their achievements and uh, their beginning of their lives uh, in the next phase. And uh, so congratulations, everybody. Wonderful semester. And let's hope for some warm weather sometime soon. Have a great day.